Passionate, driven, enthusiastic, euphoric. This is who we are as entrepreneurs, but how we leverage these incredible attributes to dream and build businesses that scale and grow is what this podcast is all about. Hello, I'm attorneypreneur Josh Brown, and welcome to Franchise Euphoria. Hello, everybody. Josh Brown here, and happy early 4th of July. It is Thursday, July 3rd, and I am gearing up to get out of town with my family, enjoy some nice quality family time. And so in lieu of an episode today, I'm actually going to play you a recent interview where I was interviewed by another fellow attorney who has a great podcast called Legal Marketing Made Easy, and he focuses on that um, for attorneys and law firms and sort of highlights attorneys that are doing things things in marketing that's unique, different, and effective. And through this interview, I think you'll get some really good uh, insight on my background and how I got to be an attorney and doing what I'm doing. And I think you'll you'll learn some things in terms of how I'm doing marketing and things with my podcast and social media that you can certainly apply to your businesses and always thinking maybe a little bit outside the box. And I think that can certainly provide some great um, advantages for you and differentiate you from the pack. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this interview and I look forward to uh, having another regular episode on Tuesday. Josh, hi, how are you doing today? Doing great. Jim, how are you doing? Doing great. So today's guest is Josh Brown, a franchise and entrepreneur attorney from Indiana and host and creator of Franchise Euphoria, the top rated franchise podcast on iTunes. Josh helps entrepreneurs turn their creativity into real businesses and their businesses into franchises. He also serves as outside counsel, counsel excuse me, for tech entrepreneurs and helps people to buy franchises the right way. So, Josh, I want to thank you real quick for being on the podcast today. So why don't you go ahead and just give a brief introduction of you and your law practice um, and uh, what you're doing right now. Well, yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. I really enjoy your podcast. Um, I love what you're doing. And uh, it's been it's been great. Uh just getting to know you. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a practicing attorney, um, an entrepreneur in Indiana. I've been licensed since uh, 2006 was when I graduated law school. So practicing a little over uh, eight years now. And really, it was kind of interesting. When I, when I graduated law school, um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. You know, I'd sort of fallen into the, the um, I call it the trap really of, you know, thinking, okay, you got to go work for, uh, you know, a big firm. And, and uh, I really thought I'd go work for a big firm, work up to partner and, you know, live happily ever after. And what I realized was, was that's really kind of the path I took. And, but along that way, I was miserable. I mean, I, I really didn't enjoy what I was doing. And I'm one of those non-traditional uh, law students. So, I mean, between undergrad and law school, I worked for five years in business management. And one of the things I did was I worked and helped two different uh, franchise owner operators start and grow their business here locally. And so as I was in the midst of working at a firm doing um, commercial litigation, uh, insurance defense type work, which I knew, I mean, I just hated. Um, I, I said, God, what, what what can I do? I mean, I got to do something. I and, and I started thinking about all, the, all my experiences and everything that I enjoyed doing. I thought, you know, I really want to work with small businesses. I mean, I really like working with entrepreneurs. I like getting to know my clients. I like getting to know small business owners. They're sort of the engine that that makes the economy uh, go round and round. And, but then I thought, God, I don't want to be just w some other small business attorney. It's like, Hey, I'm a small business attorney. Okay. You and, and a thousand other people. So I thought, how can I really niche myself? And, I, and that's what led me to franchising. I thought, well, I, I know about franchising from a business perspective, but I don't know anything about it from a legal perspective. So I started doing research and this was maybe 
I don't know, four or five years ago and, and uh, started realizing, holy cow, there, there's a there's a lot of interesting issues in franchising and there's not a lot of attorneys that are marketing themselves that way. They're, they're, they're sort of, uh, franchising is part of sort of a corporate practice, but you don't really see a lot of law firms or attorneys, at least in Indiana or, or some of the surrounding states, marketing themselves that way. And I, I said to myself, uh, and, and this will be good, Jim, for for you know the the legal marketing part of it. I said, you know what, the next cocktail party I go to, I'm just going to introduce myself as a franchise attorney. So I did that, and it was amazing the response. And ever since, it's been amazing the response. When I said, hey, the difference between saying, hey, I'm a franchise attorney versus saying I'm a small business attorney, every single person says one of two things. Really, that's so fascinating. I want to hear more about that because I thought about buying a franchise at some time. Or, hey, I need to introduce you to so-and-so because they've got a business that they want to turn into a franchise or that they own a franchise. I started realizing myself, man, this has some stickiness to it. And uh, and then I started getting people who I would meet at these networking events and cocktail parties. Two, three, four months later, after I met them the first time, will send me an email that says, hey, Josh, hope all's going well. Was thinking of you when I I got this and it would be something relating to franchising. And I thought, man, from a marketing perspective, this is great. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, that's really what got me in to, to franchising. And I slowly but surely started building up my own practice and I was working at other law firms um, and just really wanted to do it my own way. As you and I have dis- discussed off the air, I mean, I, I, I do a lot of stuff with technology. I've got my own podcast, my blog. I'm very active in the digital space. And in the law firms I was with, that was sort of foreign territory to, for them. And, and I really wanted to do it my own way. And so about a little over a year ago, I launched my, my own practice, um, despite the fact that for probably the last three plus years, I've had all my own clients, just was, was working within the confines of, of another law firm. Well, that Josh, that's fantastic. And Lawyer Nation, one thing I want you to really listen and, and maybe rewind and listen to what Josh said there uh, is so important is how he has branded himself as a franchise lawyer, not just another corporate and, and, and small business lawyer, which is what so many lawyers do. And there's they're just a dime a dozen out there. But I, I bet you if you did a Google search in your jurisdiction, looked up franchise lawyers, there's probably not that many. I think that was just a, a brilliant move. Um, um, from a marketing perspective, Josh, and I, I really appreciate you sharing that and 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 commend you for for going that way because uh, I know it's not always easy to niche yourself in that way. Um, before we move forward uh, and talk more about your journey and and um, and how you got to where you are today, although you've given a pretty good introduction uh, into that. Um, do you have an inspirational quote you can share with our listeners today? Yeah, I mean, I, I look, I love good quotes. I, I know many good quotes, but I'd say the one that's been most inspirational to me and is uh, uh, Steve Jobs, uh, who said, the journey is the reward. Um, and really, I live by that every single day. I mean, I think it's really easy um, as attorneys, as entrepreneurs, as business people um, to always be chasing the the solution um, and and oh I got if only oh just when I get there just when I get there I'm close I'm close no the journey is the reward I mean if you're doing what what lights you up what what sets you on fire if you're doing what you're good at and if you're doing it in a way where where you've got an economic model to make money up by doing it you've got a business and your journey really is the reward if you're not doing that then you're living in probably hell i mean you're probably on a path that's not right for you but what i love about that quote and its simplicity is that it's so true and it's such a great measure to to ask yourself hey it, it is do I enjoy what I do? Am I enjoying going through this process? And if the answer is yes, then um, then you're probably on a good path. And uh, if the answer is no, then then maybe you should think about doing something differently. I mean, I also think it was Steve Jobs who said, I don't know if it was in an interview or in his in, in one of his speeches or something where he said, you know, he always if he had too many days in a row where he wasn't finding enjoyment with what he did, he would really stop and think, well, why am I doing this? And, and I need to make some changes. And so I think a lot, I think too many people um, don't 
do that. Um, don't take that introspective kind of look at at what they're doing and how they're living and and um, and uh, and where they're going uh, with their life and business. That's that's a great quote, and I I have to remember back when, um, and I want to talk to you about this too because you may have had a similar experience. But I remember way back in 2005 when I had made the decision to start my own law practice long before that. But in 2005, I was um, working at a medical malpractice firm doing defense of hospitals. And I remember my, my job as a lowly associate there was basically to take stacks and stacks of deposition transcripts and transcribe them into indexes um, so that the attorney that was trying, theoretically trying the cases, um, could have like a summary of the transcript in anticipation of trial. And it was probably the most, you know, just boring, uh, mind numbing work you could possibly imagine. And that was not rewarding to me. So when I think about the journey is the reward for me, that was kind of the, the tipping point for me to start my own practice. And then I gave my notice shortly thereafter. So, um, so I appreciate that quote, Josh. Well, think about this, Jim, real quick before we go go on to the next question. I mean, there I think it's careerbliss.com. I saw a statistic on there that said the number one unhappiest job in America is that of an associate attorney. I mean, just, <laughs> the, despite the fact that the average pay, I think on their site, they said well, the average pay was $111,000. It's the number one unhappiest job. Now think about how sad is that? You know, how sad is that 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 I don't know about you or, or any of the listeners, but I know for myself, I paid for my law. I'm still paying for my law school. I graduated yeah, law school too. six figure debt, and I'm paying that bad boy back, right? So, and and I love it. I I'm, I loved my law school. In fact, I'm going back there to speak, and and uh, I, I love it. I mean, it's given me so many opportunities. But I didn't go to law school to then put myself as one of the unhappiest. <laughs> <laughs> positions. I mean, you got to be kidding me. I mean, I, I just, I'm not wired that way. I, but you're exactly right. I mean, so many people are currently experiencing what you've experienced, what I've experienced, and they're just stuck there. And, um, boy, what a lonely and, and in my mind, sad, sad place to be. And it just doesn't have to be that way. No, and, 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 and there's so much fear that goes into starting your own practice, and, and if people can really just understand that it will be okay, and, and that's really why I created this this podcast, is to kind of share these stories of attorneys like you and some of my other past guests who have made that leap from law firm to solo practice and, and maybe now have bigger practices that they are kind of in charge of, and, and how they have done it successfully, and um and, and so Lawyer Nation, if you're out there and you're sitting at your desk at your law firm um, where you're an associate and you're listening to this podcast, maybe with your earbuds on and uh, your earbuds in and, and, and trying to think about whether or not you should give your notice, you know, you can do it. You can start your law practice um, and you can be successful. So, um, well, let's let's get into uh, some of the things I want to talk to you about today here, Josh. And, and I really want to dig a little bit deeper. You know, you gave a good overview of how you got from law school to the law firm job you were at to um, to starting your own practice, but why don't we why don't we get a little deeper here and really talk about um, how it was that that you you were at that firm you didn't enjoy it and how it was that you actually made that decision to go about. Uh, starting your own law practice. Well, actually, I've been. I was at several firms, and they were all. So when I when I graduated, I worked for um, a medium to large firm, probably on the larger side for for Indiana, and. Um, while working there, I was doing insurance defense, worked with great attorneys, never really found satisfaction with it. And then I had an opportunity, um, literally got a call from an appellate judge or one of the appellate judge's clerks that said, hey, you know, we've, there's an opening and, and the judge wants to interview you to come in and, and be a clerk. I mean, th through law school, I had done you know law review and had done moot court and had argued a, a case um I had this unique situation um, where I, I argued a case before the Indiana Supreme Court right after I graduated law school, even before I had taken the bar exam. And um, so one of the so I got a call to basically go uh, be a clerk for an appellate judge. So I did that. And then when I and that was an amazing experience, the judge is become a friend and, and, and what a great experience. It's not something I'd want to do for my career, but it was, it was such great insight into, um, 
into the court and getting to know a lot of judges. But from that, I went to a firm, and, and this was back when the economy kind of started tanking uh, for attorneys. But I had an opportunity to go to a firm that was really uh, doing work that I didn't really have any experience in, but it was litigation based, and um, they had they had hired me. Um, and, and I think there was a little bit of a misunderstanding because I thought I was going to go in and work with sort of a litigation team. And then when I got there, it was sort of like I was the litigation team and I didn't really have that much. <laughs> that happens experience. all the time, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't really have much experience. Then we got in and I just really uh, didn't really like what I was doing doing i didn't I, I didn't like the atmosphere of the firm and there were some internal things going on and i i, I decided very quickly i got to look for something else but rather than acting quickly i just i just stuck with it and um slowly over time my my work deteriorated and my relationships there deteriorated to the point where um, uh, they fired me. Um, I was in the process of leaving anyways, but they, they, and it was absolutely demoralizing. I've never been fired from anything in my life, you know? And, um, and looking back on it now though, it was probably the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Um, and then from there I went to work at, um, at another law firm and got, uh, got some great experience and then, and then decided to, uh, to essentially, you know, launch out, launch out on my own. But, you know, this was not, I don't want to paint a rosy picture of, you know, it, it's been just sort of a smooth sailing all the way through. I mean, looking back now that I have my own practice, I realize that if I look back at everything, I should have started my own practice a long time ago. And, but part of that, part of the reason I didn't was I was fearful. You know, I was scared. Um, I have a family, I've got two kids, I've got a wife, um, and I'm supporting all of them. And, um, and, but yet every time I was in a situation where I was flourishing and each, each place I've been went well, I kind of, checked out myself and because I didn't like the environment, I didn't like the way they were doing things. I wanted to do it my way. I wanted to be able to go out and do things and, and, and market myself a different way. And, and it was always, it was always, um, I always felt like I was working in an environment with strangers from the perspective of they just, we thought so differently. And for, for several years, I thought, it was me, you know, what's wrong with me? Why am I not? Now I realize that, you know, I just should have been doing it on my own. I mean, I just uh, more of the entrepreneurial um, kind of mindset and, and that's great. It just took me a few years to figure that out and a few bumpy roads um, to go over to finally get there. But, but there's definitely been, been challenges along the way. But as, as, as they say, you know, it's never really, it's never really a failure until you're out of the game. Right. I mean, all these things are just learning lessons and, and, uh, opportunities to, to then get into a practice or get into something that you enjoy better. So I guess on the one hand, you know, uh, one of my strengths or weaknesses, depending on how you look at it, is I'm not very patient and I'm not very good at just sucking it up and being in a place or being at a firm or doing something that I'm not happy with or that I don't find um, passion in or I don't, you know, get charged up to do it. That to me, I'm just not wired that way. And thank goodness for me, I finally figured that out. Um, and now I'm in a position where where I where I don't have to deal with those kinds of things. Well, I want to, Josh. I want to I want to dig a little bit deeper there. I want to go back to that moment and see if you can remember this when you were at that firm, and not the firm you got fired from, the firm after that. Um, and so at, at that point, how long ago was that? Well, that was that would have been four or five years ago. Okay. So did you? And so you were married, and you, did you have two kids then? So when I got, I have a five-year-old uh, daughter, okay. and then I have a four-month-old. So no, I didn't have my second. Okay. Daughter. So you, 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 but you, your wife might have been pregnant then, or yes, close to it. Yeah. So I want, I want to go back to that, to that moment. So when you were at that firm and you finally made that decision to to give your notice and start your own practice, can you take us back to then and and talk a little bit about how you made that decision and and 
and, and what happened in that day? Uh, well, so what, what happened was um, I worked for for a great attorney in a great practice where he was basically did he had a, a really large insurance conglomerate you know a set of you know three or four different companies and he did a bunch of work for them and i was traveling all around and and uh but i knew i didn't want to do that kind of work so i was also in a position because it was a small firm to really start building up my own clients so i had sort of put together in my mind okay i'm going to try to build up my own clients and see where this goes so i started doing that and slowly but surely I started getting a client here a client there started getting people who were um reaching out to me um, more from whether whether it was people who I knew from the community or whatnot. And I started to build up additional clients. And the attorney, one of the things that he allowed me to do was he incentivized me to do that um, by giving me, you know, a piece of everything that that I brought in, in addition to the salary that that he was paying me. Very, very generous, um, generous attorney. And but from for me um the biggest struggles and the biggest stress was making that decision can i do it on my own you know am i confident enough do i have do i have that ability to really sustain this will these people come with me i wasn't too concerned about his reaction now a lot of people might because Ultimately, when I told him I was going to leave and do my own thing, he was very supportive of that. And he kind of said, yeah, I think that's a great thing for you. You know, I think that would be great. Um, and in fact, we we now share office space. So the same oh, how about that. Yeah. So and it's a great relationship. I know everybody in the office. Um, but there is one oh, there's one thing I want to mention that that um, I kind of glazed over. And that is when I decided to leave and I told the attorney, I said, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going to start my own firm. Um, I'd like to share space with you. And here's what we do. And, and he said, OK, that's great. I then went on a trip with my family and um, I started getting scared. I started getting the sort of the second guesses and the cold feet. I remember we went on a trip to uh, Vancouver and um and at that point in time, um, there was another law firm in town that had expressed an interest in me potentially coming over there and bringing sort of my small little practice and 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 being of counsel and um, and and just doing what I do over there and just working with my own clients. So after having decided that I was going to go launch on my own, I backtracked and actually went to another firm for a short period of time um, and then officially went out on my own. So so I made the, so think about this. So I, I'm sitting there, I decide I'm going to go out on my own, I decide I'm leaving and then after I put everything in motion, I just kind of was like, whoa, got really, really nervous. And when this opportunity came up to go be of counsel at another firm with my own practice, I jumped on it and I did that instead for about a eight or nine month period of time. And then I finally launched my own firm. I was working with all my own clients at that firm and I was increasing the number of clients that I had and I had been doing, I had been um, active in my blog and doing all those sorts of things. And then really that gave me the true confidence at that time to say, okay, I can do this. So let me make sure I understand that right. So then, uh, so you were working at this, uh, then this, this next firm for eight or nine months. And at that time you're building up your client base. And so by the time you actually did decide, okay, yes, now is the time I'm going to leave. You actually had some established client relationships and you had people to take with you as kind of a client base. Yeah. When I went to this, other, when I went to the last firm that I was at, um, and I had told them this. I had said, "Look at this." I said, "I was I'm planning on opening up my own shop." And they said, "Oh yeah, that's fine, but here's an opportunity. You know, we could probably work out something here if you were interested." And I said, "Yeah, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to do it." And they were they were gung ho about it. And and the truth is, uh, when I started, I mean, the first six seven months, I mean, it was awesome in terms of. I mean, they were already talking about making me a partner, and everything was going great. But just as what had happened at my other stops along the way, I got disenchanted. I started losing interest because I just didn't like how I was limited in certain capacities. I wanted to do something, but I had to go through, you know, and get permission to do this and do that. And I just, I started, um, 
getting wasn't a little, your thing. It wasn't my thing. And so, but what was great about this last stop, and, and this ties into your question as well, is they actually came to me before I went to them. I was thinking for at least a month or so, how am I going to tell these people that I'm leaving <laughs> without, I mean, I really like them. I know they like me. They came to me, the managing partner, and said, hey, listen, we can just tell you're not happy anymore. Like you were, you're like a different person. And we just want to tell you that if you want to go and do your own thing as you had originally planned on doing, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll support you in that. We don't want you to feel like we don't want you to be unhappy because obviously that's not a good fit here and it's not a good for you. And in that moment I said, gosh, yeah, I don't want to be here. I mean, I want to be doing my own thing. I've been wanting to do it for months. They go, oh yeah, we can tell. We can tell. So think about that. That's a great, that's amazing how they handled it in my opinion. Um, and um, so that freed me up to then just go, okay. And they were great. It was like, well, how much time do you want? Do you want to take some time to, to put your, to get everything set up? And I think it was over the course of the next two months where I just basically set up my own firm. And then my wife had said, when I was looking at space, I'd actually put a deposit down on a, on an office space. My wife said, why don't you go approach, you know, uh, Steve is who I used to work, work with and see if he's, if he's wants to share space with you. Cause then, you know, you'll know people over there and it won't be so lonely. And I go, yeah, I feel like I already, you know, went over that bridge. I, I don't know if he'll be interested. She's like, well, you know, Hey Josh, don't be an idiot. Just go ask. Like, what's the worst that can happen? So I did. I went over and I and I asked Steve and I said, Hey, you know, here's here's what I'm doing. And I was like, I'd love to share space with you. And he's like, Oh yeah, I would love that. Come on. So that's that's how the whole cool. thing went down. All right. Well, um, well, I'm sure you've had a lot of ups and downs um, along the, the 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 journey that you've had. And um, maybe can you think of a uh, a story of a failure that you've experienced during your journey and kind of what you learned from it? Well, I think the biggest failure to me was, I mean, I think is failure getting fired. I, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's the biggest failure that I've ever experienced, even though it's led to great things for me now. Um, but in terms of, gosh, I mean, there's, there's been so many failures I've, I've had, but I, I just, I don't really think of them as failures. I mean, I've done, if you're looking at my practice right now, right in, in my, in the first six months of my practice, I probably spent, um, 10 or $15,000 on things that I shouldn't have ever spent money on. So I consider those, you know, to be failures. Can you uh, give some examples? Well, on certain, on certain technology stuff where I, I got, I think I got stuck in the trap early on because I was so gung ho about technology. I mean, look, these are, these are great products, but I've used products like, you know, HubSpot and some of these others where I realized that where I was in the process, it just wasn't a good fit for me. And it was very, very expensive and I didn't get much value from them. And I got caught in the, the trap of trying to have technology sort of be the ultimate solution. And really technology can be a great tool to, to open up new doors, but you've, you've already got to have sort of a very clear picture and, and you, you have to have some things already in place to really, to really leverage that. I tried to use, um, I'll tell you a failure. I tried to use a, um, a company, um, and you, you know, it's funny there, there's, there, a company called, um, uh, EA help and they do virtual assistance. And that was my first. Oh, yeah, I've, I've heard of them. And, uh, you know, I know, I know Michael Hyatt's a big fan of theirs and, uh, oh, yeah. and actually that's where I had heard of them. So I contacted them and I worked with their virtual assistants for several months and absolutely got no value from it. Now, their relationship manager they have there who's still there was fantastic and did a great job trying to make everything work. But the idea was, was you're going to get a virtual assistant who has experience and who can come right in. And that, that was not my experience. I ended up, they were very, very nice virtual assistants, but I ended up having to essentially pay them to, to train them as well. And that experience cost me 
oh geez, five, six thousand dollars where I got virtually no value from it. Um, but so I was very, very hesitant after that to pull the trigger and hire another virtual assistant. I have done that and I'm very happy with, with, with who I have now, but I didn't go through one of those, um, almost like services services. Yeah. To yeah. do it. So, well, well, I think that's a, I think that's a great example. Um, and, 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 you know, sometimes you just don't learn. And, and this is again, uh, for those of you listening at home, this is a great example of, um, how you, you don't always learn what you don't know until you try it. And you wouldn't have known that experience until you tried it. And it's not that there was you, there was some cost associated with that. And that's not to say that EA EA help is that what it was um, wouldn't work for other people. It's just that you had a bad situation with it. Um, and and but yeah, every every situation is different. And yeah, and, and you know you got to have you know part of the things. I, and here's a great lesson for people, um, especially you know the other attorneys who are maybe considering virtual assistance because it can be such a cost effective tool, is. I thought I went in thinking that I was going to get a virtual assistant who could then help me systemize things. And what I realized was you can, it, it's hard to do that, right? So you have to have some, you have to have almost a very clear picture of what you want to use your virtual assistant for before you hire them. Because if you don't, um, it's going to be very, very challenging to feel like you're getting, you're getting great value. And just like with any kind of um, independent contractor or employee or anything, it's almost like you have to have a job description and you're not going to find, or it's very difficult to find one assistant that can do everything. Just like with attorneys, just like with anybody in any profession, you have your strengths and you have your weaknesses. And so you know, what I've learned is you have to sort of have an idea and say, okay, this is what I'm looking for you to do. And are you able to do that for me. And my first experience with, with VAs, I was almost looking for them to come in and me say, okay, here's what my practice is all about. Here's what I do. How can you help me? And it was sort of like, uh, well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. And, yeah. and there's a great book on that, that subject, virtual freedom by Chris Ducker. It was just released a couple months ago. I don't know if you've read it. Um, I have, it's a great book. Um, and, and he echoes exactly what you're saying right now. Now, Chris Ducker operates a virtual staff finder agency out of the Philippines, but um, so most of his virtual help comes from overseas, but there are other places in America and, and the book kind of transcends that. It, it's a, a basic guideline for how to find a good virtual assistant if that's something you're looking to do. Yeah, I like Chris uh, very much. And actually his book is on my two to-do list in terms of reading. I haven't read it yet, but I like Chris very much. He's got a real good, uh, got a real good business. I've talked to him several times about, you know, utilizing his service. I didn't end up doing that cause I found, I found somebody else who's worked out really, really well, um, here, um, in the States, but, but, um, but yeah, he's, uh, he was, he was one of the people that, that talked to me about that and, and, and said, Hey, you know, you, you can't expect to hire a VA and a have them do everything. Um, cause it's not going to happen. You're not gonna be happy, but B you, you kind of have to have a very, very clear picture of what you want them to do in order to get the most value from them. That's right. That's right. So, well, that, that is a fantastic, uh, story of failure. Let's flip it around for a minute and let's talk about a light bulb moment and let's talk about something, maybe a moment you had where you really started to quote unquote, get, um, the practice or the business of, of having a law practice and really started to find your groove. Do you, can you, can you think back and, and share a moment where that would have happened? Yeah. I mean the, the, it, it really came about probably, um, four to five months into me launching my own firm. Right. So I, I had the aha moment of wanting to focus on franchising back when I was working for another law firm, as we discussed. So that's, that's obviously an aha light bulb moment. And I had that, um, sort of thought solidified when I started telling people about it and, and people started, it was really resonating with people and people were referring, um, uh, potential clients and referrals over to me. So that was, that was a sort of, a sort of an aha moment, but uh, the, the bigger aha moment for me after I got over and, and this will probably resonate with you, Jim, you know, when you first launch your own practice, I mean, I barely slept. 
I was so nervous about, oh my God, what if the phone doesn't ring? What, yeah, I've got this work now, but what about when it dries up? Is there going to be more stuff coming? It took me about four or five months to really get comfortable. Not that I don't think about that, but I really got comfortable with the idea that, yeah, I mean, you do a good job for people. You do. Um, and, and, and the work is there, but the aha moment was I realized that the way that I was and have been strategizing um, in terms of my marketing for my practice and my my blog, Indie Franchise Law, my Franchise Euphoria podcast, and everything that I was doing and tying in my online um, presence and involvement and engagement with my offline networking, along with having a really niche practice was the secret sauce to my success because every, every time I would stray outside of it and every time somebody would call and say, Hey, can you help me with this? And I knew it was, it was outside of, uh, exactly what I wanted to focus on. And I did it. I always regretted it, but then I always, it, the, the big moment to me was when I kind of saw everything work well. So I've, you know, it was, at, it was right at that time, probably like four or five months in where I started seeing, wow, I'm really starting to get some traction in the online space through my blog and everything. And I really started seeing the possibility of, boy, God, I should add a podcast to this. And that would just be really cool. It'd be, it would open, it could leverage my expertise and it could tie in perfectly to my law practice. But always with the idea that at the end of the day, people do business with people they know, like, and trust, and that's no different online. So you always have to leverage the online with what you're doing offline. So I'm really involved with uh, local networking and the uh, chambers of commerce and other kinds of things, sort of feet on the ground kind of stuff. And I combine the online with the offline and having a very, very particular specific niche. And that's sort of been my secret sauce. That's, that's, that's really great advice. And um, I think what a lot of lawyers do is they maybe combine one or two of those things. But I think the fact that you've combined three of those things together, um, that, that I can totally see how powerful that would be uh, for you and, and, and with such a great niche that, you know, and, and it just really, you know, helps you position yourself as, you know, the, the go to person for franchise law in your area, because wherever anyone's going to be looking, they're going to see you because number one, you're probably one of the only lawyers that's doing that type of law. And then, you know, when they go to chamber meetings, you know, what you talk about and what you project during, you know, your, your networking meetings is the same as what people are going to find if they go online to look for you, I would guess. Yeah, and here's one thing that that's happened to me as well that that I could not have anticipated, but you know when you do things differently, when you um, you do things from your your sort of you know your true authentic self, and it's just me. I mean, I'm just me, and I practice law. I'm a very you know I'm not one of those confrontational type people. I'm very optimistic, and so just by being that way, I mean, I'm just different from a lot of attorneys. But what I hear from my clients over and over again is one of the reasons they like working with me is that they know I'm, I'm, I'm up to speed with what's going on, on, on the digital side of things and online and that I'm progressive. And they really like that as small business entrepreneurs, they want to know that their attorney is not somebody who's behind the times from that perspective. And that's something I could have never anticipated, but I've had several clients tell me that. And I thought, wow, that's one of those unanticipated things that just is kind of like, well, that's kind of cool. Cause I did never even thought about that. I'm sure. Yeah. No, that, that's really cool. Um, so, well, well, uh, Josh, let's get into kind of the final segment today, which is the final five questions I'm going to ask you. And this is just, um, quick questions with quick answers. Um, are you ready to go? Yep. All right. So the first question I have for you is what was holding you back from starting your own law firm? A fear of failure. What is the best business advice that you have ever received? <laughs> the best business advice was from, I, I believe it was my dad who basically said, Hey, what's the worst thing that can happen? You go work for another crappy law firm. <laughs> Joking, not, <laughs> not saying that they were crappy, but in other words, you know, you're miserable at another law firm. That's not so bad. 
That's uh, and that's great. That's great business advice. And for lawyers out there, for you listening at home, um, you know, the worst thing that can happen if you do start a solo practice is, you know, you don't make it and you go back to work for somebody else. That's the nice thing about having a law license. And you'll you know, be we've better. Got a skill. You'll be better. You'll be better by oh, having absolutely. that experience. Yeah. Absolutely. So can you share a personal habit that you uh, believe contrib- contributes to your success? Yeah, I'm I and I'm, I'm tenacious. And from this perspective of that, a personal habit of mine is that I am very inquisitive and I'm very open to meeting and talking and getting involved Um and different things and, and, and meeting different people. And that might, that might sound like, I mean, maybe some, I don't know if you're looking for like, Oh, I do this every single day, but I will tell you, um, the one thing that, that has done so much for me is just actually being interested in, in other people. I mean, that's a personal habit of mine as well. I'm talking to people when I'm engaging with people, I'm always interested in what they're doing. And I think that comes just naturally to me, but I think that also resonates really well, um, with other people, you know? And so that's been a huge, I think that's been a huge part of my success because by being interested in other people, I learn a lot about them. What one or two internet tools or resources do you use in your law practice that you would recommend to our listeners? Boy, that's a hard question because as you and I've talked, we we use a lot of tools. Um, So I'll tell you one tool that I love, um, Ruby Receptionist, and that's the the virtual receptionist company, uh, callruby.com, based out of Oregon. So I never answer my phones, and that's been huge, huge, huge. I'd say the other, the other tool that I'm really starting to like a lot and really getting used to is, um, is salesforce.com. And, and here's why, I mean, that's a, it's a practice management tool, but even better than that. And I think better than all the other legal practice management tools out there. Cause I've tried all of them. I've tried Clio rocket matter, my case, you name it. I bet you I've tried it. Here's what those lack that Salesforce doesn't lack lead capturing from this. So you can basically I'm out. I go to a lot of different events. I meet a lot of people meeting, you know, get business cards. You, you talk to somebody, Salesforce has a great ability. If you go back into it and you can capture conversations and be able to do set up follow-ups for all those prospects and leads and referral partners. And in my opinion, a lot of solo and small firm lawyers miss out on opportunities because they, you can't keep up with all that. It's, you can't keep up with all of it in your head or writing it down on a notepad and managing your day-to-day practice. So sales, Salesforce has a great combination of being able to help you manage leads and follow up and prospects, but also manage your day-to-day practice. And I'm going to, I know this is the, the, we're going through quick segments here, but I do want to ask you a couple uh, quick follow-ups. And first, before I do that, I just want want to mention uh, to you at home that Ruby Receptionist is one of our preferred vendors. And if you go to www.callruby.com slash LMME, you can get a two-week free trial of Ruby Receptionist. They will waive the activation fee as well if you choose to go ahead and use them. So um, I use Ruby Receptionist. I've used them for almost four years. I love them. So I totally agree with you on that. Now, I want to ask you about Salesforce because, as you know, you listen to my podcast and I've talked about this before. I use Infusionsoft and in combination with my case. And I use Infusionsoft primarily for my back end marketing um, to automate my marketing. So, if I'm understanding you correctly, you kind of use Salesforce as kind of both those tools in one. Is that right? Yes. And so, why did you choose to use Salesforce versus? Um, can you go a little bit more into it? Because I know you've said you've experimented with Infusionsoft as well. Um, Why did you choose on? Why did you settle on Salesforce? I settled on Salesforce because it, to me, it's um, it's a lot more intuitive. Um, it's in, in, I, I used Infusionsoft for several months, and here's what I think about Infusionsoft. I think it's a powerful tool. I know a lot of people who have found great success with it. I happen to believe that to get the biggest bang for your buck with Infusionsoft, you have to already have certain products or 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 
th- that you already want to uh, put out there. Um, and you have to have you almost have to have somebody dedicated to help you set that thing up on a consistent basis. I mean, it is a con- in my opinion, it's a very confusing um, product. And I didn't like the way. First of all, I didn't have that extra person who could dedicate all that time to it. I got very frustrated trying to um, set it up myself, and I didn't feel like I was at a point where I really needed it. I mean, I use Aweber, which I love. Um, Aweber, Mailchimp. You know, there's another one that's great called get response but i use those right now as sort of lead capture follow-ups and i you know i know another there's another attorney who i've who i know really well rachel rogers um she loves Infusionsoft. I know a lot of people like yourself love it. For me, I don't know what it was. I think I maybe I just got frustrated with it. But what Salesforce does that's different is I think it's a much easier interface that's, that's more intuitive. Um, and I think for the way in which my practice is built, I, I think it's got it's 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 got the ability, as I said, to be more of like a practice management day in, day out practice management tool, as well as helping me with not just the capturing of email leads and stuff like that, but the follow up with it. And I found it very challenging to to have sort of um, the same automated follow-ups with prospects and stuff like that. Like I, I totally get the whole long tail um, lead generation and all that stuff. But what I wanted more of was I wanted to, okay, I go out and meet with so-and-so, put his information in, put you know a reminder, um, be able to build up an entire file on somebody. And Salesforce just, just seemed to be a little bit of a better solution. I think Infusionsoft is really good. I think it just depends on 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 the person, the practice, um, and how you how far you are into that. I mean, I had a number of people who told me that with Infusionsoft, you'll get your biggest bang for your buck if you ha- if you already have a list of five of you know ten thousand people on your list, and you have products that are already put together, and you you now you just want to automate a lot of that. Well, I didn't have that. Um, and so I just didn't find as much value with it. All right, fair enough. Um, well, let's see. So, what book would you recommend to someone who's starting a law firm? Boy, the number one book uh, for me, because when you're starting a law firm, you're also becoming an entrepreneur, whether you like it or not, uh, would be the E Myth Revisited. Um, I had the chance to interview Michael Gerber on my podcast, and that was sort of a, a dream interview for me because his book was so. Um, uh, so instructive for me on how you you, you build a business um, so that the business doesn't run you, but you run the business. And I think that there is an e myth for attorneys, which is fine. I you know you get that too. I like e myth the regular e myth revisited a little bit better, um, where he walks through basically Sarah and her pie shop, and 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 he's a big proponent of the franchising model and thinking of your business as though you're going to replicate it 5,000 times. And here's the thing, even if you're not going to replicate your law practice, which you're probably not 5,000 times, if you think in those terms and think in terms of setting up systems and processes, you're going to have a much more efficient law firm and you're going to have likely a much more profitable long, uh, law firm long term. So I think that's a great book for an attorney to read before they set up their practice. And would you be surprised to know that you were not the first person to recommend that book on the podcast? Uh, that's a great book. I love that book. I've had it on my shelf for, for many years. Um, all right. Final question here, and then we'll call it a wrap. So if you had to start over from scratch with everything that you know today, but nothing but a laptop, your law license, and $500, what would you do in your first week? Oh, gosh. Okay. So what I would do is I would immediately get, buy a URL um, from GoDaddy or one of those two, you know, for 10, for 10, 12 bucks. I'd, I'd, you know, go, go look, go check out Michael Hyatt's, you know, how to set up a WordPress site in 20 minutes. Um, and I'd set up a, I'd set up a blog um, and I just get that going. I'd pick a really specific area that I was interested in. And with the rest of the money, I would go out into the local community and try to find one or two key players um, 
take them out to coffee, take them out to dinner, take them out to drinks, whatever. And I would get very, very clear on what it is I'm doing and try to leverage what they're doing and their contacts within the community to then have them introduce me to other people. Awesome. Well, Josh, I think that's a, that's a great answer and that's a great place to end the interview today. So I really appreciate your time and, um, uh, we could, oh, before we go, I almost forgot. Can you uh, give our listeners kind of your contact information and tell them where they can reach out to find you if they are so inclined? Sure. So you can reach me at, um, at Josh at Indy, I-N-D-Y, Franchise Law. Dot com so indiefranchiselaw.com that's also my my uh, website and blog um, I've also got a, uh, a podcast called franchise euphoria that you can check out on iTunes or uh, on my on my website and uh, if you're old school you can call me my my number is 317-688-9111 and uh but yeah i mean i'd love to anybody who's got questions or anybody who just wants to chat or introduce yourself i first of all i love meeting other attorneys i love meeting other uh people who are thinking about using their law degree in in different and unique ways so i would encourage people to reach out if they're so inclined Awesome. Well, thank you, Josh. I really appreciate your time today, and I hope you have a great afternoon. All right. Thanks a lot, Jim. Appreciate it. Thanks for being with us today on the Franchise Euphoria podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to go to iTunes and provide a review. Also, please remember that although Josh Brown is a licensed and practicing attorney, Nothing contained in this podcast should be construed as legal advice, because it is not. The information contained in this podcast is general and educational in nature, and none of it should be relied upon as legal advice. That being said, if you have questions for Josh and would like to contact him, please email him at josh at franchiseeuphoria.com. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope you tune in to our next weekly episode.